My name is Jesse Meerman, um, and I get to talk to you this morning about wrestling with God. <clears throat> Believe it or not, I used to do a little wrestling. That was about 100 and, I don't know, it was 65 pounds ago, let's just say that. <laughs> I used to look like that, right? I was always the guy on the bottom, we'll just say that. <laughs> Wrestled for half a season, got pinned every match. And so I said, why am I missing work for this? <clears throat> so, I want to talk to you about wrestling with God. And we've had a lot of wonderful words in the last few weeks and months about, well, for our, our entire Christian career, about how wonderful it is to sit on God's lap, how he just loves us. He loves to embrace us and hold us in the physical relationship we can have with him. Doesn't it feel like that sometimes? You're worshiping and it feels like you're just in his arms. And it's so peaceful and relaxing. And then there's another part of our Christian life. They're like, God, it feels like you're fighting against me. It feels like I just can't get what I'm asking for. It's just so difficult. Why does it have to be so hard? I thought you were my friend. Why is my life not going the way I expected it to? Now I want to talk about wrestling with God. Snuggling with God is more of a mother's role. I talked to my wife and my mother about wrestling, and they said, we wrestle with our kids. And I said, do you really? Because it looks like you snuggle with the kids. And they said, yeah, I guess that's more what it is. And God loves to fill that role for us. But sometimes dads like to get rough with the kids. We see Genesis 32. You know we were going to this passage, right? Genesis 32. And um, this is the story of Jacob, of course, when Jacob wrestled with God. Now, a little of the backstory is that Jacob had run from his brother Esau. This was his, his uh, upbringing, the experiences that were still in his head. It's the last time he remembered his brother, he had just cheated his brother out of something that Esau thought was his, his birthright. And he was running for good reason because Esau, Esau had told everybody, as soon as I find Jacob, I'm killing him. So, Esau, or so Jacob had run away and he had gone to a foreign land. He had gone to seek his fortune in the world and he'd made it. He'd made his fortune. And he'd gone to his... I can't remember exactly what the relation would be, but some distant relation in the far land. And he had struggled and he had strived and he had been cheated and he had been, the rules had changed on him. And still, because he had tried so hard and he persevered, he had succeeded. So he was coming back home and he had not just his person because he left and that's all he had was himself. He even had to use a, pill, a rock for a pillow. He had nothing. And when he's coming back, he had flocks, herds, four wives and 11 kids, and it was, he was a wealthy, wealthy man on his way back. But he comes just before he crosses the last brook to get into his own land. He hears that Esau, Esau is coming to look for him. Esau heard he's coming home, and Esau is coming with 400 men. And it didn't matter how successful Jacob had been in life, he was still scared of the bully that he met when he was a kid. Has that ever happened to you? You say, I'm, I've succeeded in business, maybe you're a millionaire. But you still, when you meet this kid who used to push you around in junior high, you still wet your pants. <laughs> and this is Jacob. He had no reason to be afraid because he was powerful and he was successful. But he had experiences with Esau that gave him good reason to be afraid. <clears throat> so that night, Jacob got up and he took his two wives. The other two were just concubines. But they were, they were we'd call them wives his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. So you see, he sends everything across and he's the last one to go. Can, can you feel that fear in him? He's afraid to cross. He's like, I'm going to send everything across. And some of it was presents to Esau to try to get on his good side. But he's still afraid to cross himself. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. So doesn't that, how does that sentence make any sense at all? It says the man could not overpower him, so he touched his hip and wrenched out a socket. Well, we know now that this person is God that he's wrestling with, some form of incarnate God, maybe, maybe Christ himself. But because God was able to touch his hip and wrench it out of socket, we knew that he was so much more powerful than Jacob was. But he chose at that time to become weak, just like Jesus chose to become weak, to become a person, 
to become just like one of us. And he chose not to exert all of his power in wrestling Jacob. I'm going to wrestle him as a man, and we'll see what happens. And when he saw that as a man he could not overcome Jacob, he gave him an injury. And this is, don't we feel like this sometimes? God, you took something from me that I thought I needed. You took something from me that, I, that you gave me, maybe even my health. And I pray for my health and I say, this, is this not my birthright? Don't you say that by your stripes I'm healed? And why is it that I have a limp? And we're going to find out one of the reasons why God took this from Jacob. The man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So even though Jacob is injured, he's still fighting with the guy, and he will not give up because he wants the blessing. We see this over and over in Jacob's life. He wants blessing. He wants affirmation. He wants to be the one that people are giving to because he's been cheated so many times. He's, he's hungry for this blessing. And the blessing is for the man to say, good job, you beat me, right? For the man to say, uncle, I'm proud of you. He says, I won't let you go until you bless me. And the man said to him, asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Now, Jacob means the usurper or the one who grasps the heel because when Jacob was born, his twin brother Esau, he was holding on to his heel as he came out. He's like, I want that birthright so bad that I'm trying to pull him back and be the first one out. And it was a, it's a euphemism for uh, the deceiver, is what, what the Hebrews would say when they say someone who grasps the heel is someone who deceives. It's like you're tripping somebody up. So this is what Jacob was known as, and that's how he operated. Everybody knew him as the deceiver, and he acted like the deceiver because that was his name. So the man asked him, what's your name? Jacob. The man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Israel means struggles with God. And this is going to be his name from now on, someone who struggles with God. This is how he is going to be known. Because God had a respect for him, and God wanted him now to be known as the one who had not only overcome in his struggles with humans, but even who had grabbed hold of God and wrestled with him and been so passionate and vigorous that he would not let God go until he was blessed. I call you Israel. He replied, why do you ask my name? And then he blessed him there. So Jacob called that place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. So he went to meet his brother Esau, that he was so afraid of, and he was also limping. He had a disability. So why? Doesn't it, you read this story and you're like, what in the world is going on there? What was this whole struggle about? Listen, I want to talk to you this morning about why God wants us to wrestle with him. Why it's not just snuggling. Why it's also wrestling. Why it has to feel like a fight sometimes. Psalm 144, verse 1 and 2 said, Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He is my steadfast love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I take refuge, who subdues people under me. All right, he's my shield. He's my stronghold. I run to him and I'm safe. This is a place where I can just be on his lap. Daddy, I'm secure right here. But he also is training our hands for battle, my fingers for war. This is why sometimes he fights with us. There are battles afoot. There's a spiritual war going on. And we can't always see it with our eyes, but we definitely experience it. And sometimes we feel like pawns in that battle. Isn't it, isn't it obvious to us now how much there's going on that we don't see, we can't understand, we'll find out after the fact, if at all. But it's a spiritual battle that's happening. And he wants us to train our hands for war because he expects us to participate. He expects us not to just be passive, not just to say, God, thy will be done. That is a wonderful thing to say. But he says sometimes we have to make God's will be done. It's our job to go out into the world and be passionate and aggressive and strong. And he's saying, I want to teach your hands to fight. So you're going to wrestle with me. Matthew eleven twelve, 12, when Jesus heard that John the Baptist was in prison, he said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, 
the kingdom of heaven has been treated violently. And the violent men take it by force. If we look at the context of this whole passage, it's talking about how uh, Jesus, from his perspective, he is in the kingdom of heaven, right? This is where he's always lived. And he sees all these people crashing the gates of heaven, wanting to get in. Violently, they're saying, I'm not going to be kept out of the kingdom of heaven. John the Baptist would preach and huge crowds would come. And here's Jesus preaching and huge crowds are coming. And it's like the gates of heaven are being crashed. My buddy Devar, he was in a, a soccer riot one time. And the tickets were all sold out to the soccer game. And there were just thousands of people outside the stadium crushing, trying to get in. And the, the people running the stadium, they understood that if we don't open the gates, there's people going to die out there because the crush was so powerful. And he said when they finally did open the gates, he said, I could have picked up my feet. I had no choice whether I was going in or not. He said, I didn't even have to walk. I could have just picked up my feet and still been carried in. The crush of people was so strong. And this is what the picture I get when Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven has been treated violently and violent men take it by force. We need to be crashing the gates of heaven. This is what God imagines. We need to be so passionate to get into the kingdom of heaven that we are just crashing the gates and we want to get in so bad. He's looking for passionate followers. We learn how to be vigorous and strong when we wrestle with God. It's wonderful to sit in his lap and be safe. But he also wants us to learn how to fight. This is something I often do with my kids. We're fighting. We're, it's not a real fight, right? It's just because I want to teach them how to be strong. It's, it's a natural thing. It's a natural relationship I have, especially with my son. I wrestled with my girls all the time, and that was fun. But with Peter, it seems like it is serious business. It feels like it's something I have to do with him. And it's something that he needs also because he's so intense and passionate and strong. And he needs some place where he can go and release that. And if he wants to fight, it's not acceptable for him just to go out and fight with his sisters. That's got to be stopped. I've got I to gotta put a stop to that. But he can hit me. He's not going to hurt me. Peter needs to learn to be aggressive. He needs to know that it's okay to be aggressive with me. He needs to learn how to be passionate. He needs to learn how to fight for something. If we always give our children what they need, and every time they have any desire or want, we just give it to them, then they're not going to learn how to go out and get it for themselves. They're not going to learn how to fight and engage in the spiritual battle that is going on. We need a place where we can be aggressive to learn how to do these things. Because God's not going to just throw us out into the fray without having had any practice. If I just said to my kid, all right, you want to learn how to fight? Go take on that kid. I know he's bigger than you, but just go punch him in the face and see what happens. <laughs> That's not going to teach him to fight. He's just it's going to teach him how to lose. <laughs> and so it's much better if he can learn those kind of things from me. And if he can get out his aggression on me. It's like God is sparring with us. He's like, you want something? That's fine. Let's, I, I understand that you want that, but how bad do you want it? Come at me. Let's see. All right? And then he's teaching us moves, too. He's like, watch the guy's left. And he hits you in the face with his left. And you're like, God, oh, that hurt. Yeah, watch the left. And every time he hits you in the face with the left, he's like, I'm going to keep doing that until you learn to watch the left. I'm going to continue to do this because I want you to learn from your experiences. And it can be very difficult for us, but God is teaching us. He's teaching our hands to battle. Sometimes I give them artificial hardships. I make their life a little harder than it needs to be because we live in really good times and we can kind of look out and, and think that these are bad times, but they aren't. And my kids have more good things than they deserve and quite often they want something and I say, all right, if you want that, you're going to have to work for it. You're going to have to earn some money. You're going to have to pay for it. Certainly, I could go out and buy it for you, but I'm not going to because I want you to learn how hard it is to earn that. I want you to learn what it takes. So they've got to go out and work and do something difficult and then, once they've made that money, now they've got to make a choice. Do I still want that thing? Because now I know how much work it took. And it makes them value things more. If your kid is, your two-year-old is sitting in the driveway crying because he's cold, and he wants you to bring him in the house, he wants you to warm him up, and you say, and you don't always just go and grab the kid and bring him in the house. Sometimes you say, you know what, you have legs. I can bring you in the house, that's easy for me to do. And I certainly love you enough to do that but I want you to get up and learn that you can walk into the house. I don't want you to learn what you can do for yourself. Sometimes we make our kids' lives harder 
than they need to be because we want them to learn how to overcome obstacles. We want them to learn to be passionate. We want them to understand what it takes to fight. And so we do this on purpose with our kids because there's a very real danger out there, a very real danger. If you remember a couple weeks ago, Eric used this verse to wonderful effect. In Psalm 8, too, it says, the lips of children and in, from the lips of children and infants, you have established praise. And we had that wonderful story about the children praising God. They didn't even know what they were doing, but it was a beautiful story that illustrated this verse. And I noticed something in the second part of this verse. It says, because of your adversaries, that you might silence the enemy and the avenger. So praise, the purpose of praise is to silence the enemy and the avenger. Now this avenger, when the people in reading Psalms, when the people singing that song heard the word, sang the word avenger, they were thinking of this. In Joshua 20, God said, tell the Israelites to designate cities of refuge as I instructed you through Moses, so that anyone who kills a person accidentally or unintentionally may flee there and find protection from the avenger of blood. This is what they heard when they heard the word avenger. When they flee to one of these cities, they are to stand at the entrance of the city gate and state their case before the elders of that city. And then the elders are to admit the fugitive into their city and provide a place to live among them. If the avenger of blood comes in pursuit, the elders must not surrender the fugitive. So this is a person, if you've done something stupid, you didn't mean to kill anybody, but you just made a mistake. You weren't taking, being careful, or maybe just the things that happen to anybody, and someone died. There's an avenger who has authority to come after you and kill you if he finds you, because the payment for blood is blood. So if, you, if, if this had happened to you, then there could be an avenger, probably a family member, or maybe even a hired assassin to come after you and kill you. But if you make it to the city of refuge, then you're safe. He's not allowed to come in after you. And he can pound on the gates and say, I want him. And the city is supposed to say, no, he made it to the city of refuge. Now, how does this apply to us? It says, from the mouths of infants and babes, you have ordained a praise to silence the, the voices. of, what is that? I missed one. to silence the enemy and the avenger. What does it mean? Well, we have all sinned. And do you ever feel sometimes like it's unfair that you were born a person and you can't avoid sinning? It says the penalty for sin is death. And you say, I didn't decide to be born. I didn't choose this. So just from being born, I'm going to sin. And that means that my, the penalty is death. That doesn't seem very fair. But God has said, I have provided for you a place of refuge even though the enemy has right to your blood, what you deserve is to die. The enemy is after you, and he has the, every right to kill you because of your sin. But God has provided for us a place of refuge. We can walk into God's arms and run into his arms and be safe. The place of refuge that he has provided for us. Um, but, and, and, this, and then the avenger will have no right to us as long as we are within God's arms. This is the danger that's out there. When we're not in God's arms, there's an avenger looking for us who has every right to our blood. When we wrestle with the Lord, we experience God's strength. When I wrestle with my kids, that's one of the things I'm doing, is I'm showing them how strong I am to make them feel safe. They know that at any moment I could just use one hand and put them on the ground. Sometimes I do that for fun. I'm wrestling three of them at a time, and you put them all down with one hand. It's the most fun when you can, when you can uh, get them all twisted up, and you can just be holding one of their hands, and they're so turned around that you're restraining all three kids with one hand, one of their hands. And they see, oh, Dad's not really trying when he's fighting us. And it's so much more fun for them to realize that Dad is so strong, and then... When they make a good move, you know, they, they might try to flip me over. Now, they're not big enough to really do that, but I'll say, that was the right move. And I'll actually roll over. And I'll, I'll give them that when they, when they do the right thing. And that's so that they can learn what the good moves are. But this whole time, they realize that Dad doesn't have to roll over for me. Sometimes he just does. And they, they 
rejoice in the strength of their father so that if we ever send this kid out and he's got something strong, something difficult that he's got to do, let's say, okay, uh, you were driving, you're practicing driving, and the tire blew, so I want you to change the tire. Even though I'm right here with you, I want you to learn how to change the tire, so you got to do it. Dad, it's hard. I don't know how. I'm right here with you. I'll walk you through it. And they can have so much confidence knowing that dad is right here. Dad knows how to change a tire. And even though they might struggle, he's going to help them through it, and it's going to happen. And they're not going to be stranded on the road because dad is with them, and dad is strong. When we're wrestling with God, we feel his power and his strength, and it gives us confidence to engage in the battle, the real battle that's out there, the dangerous battle. But there's ground rules. There's ground rules when we're fighting against God. It's not like we're fighting against the enemy. When we're fighting against the enemy, we can be as passionate and aggressive and even have, have some sort of hate against sin. When we're fighting against Dad, our father, there can't be any anger. Because as soon as my kid is angry with me, if we're, if we're fighting, it's, you know, kids can get mad once in a while. We, we have disagreements. But if we're, if we're just sparring and wrestling and they, they blow their top and they get angry with me, then the relationship has changed. We're not going to be fighting while you're angry. We're going to be talking about this and we're going to figure this out. For some reason, you're angry with me, but I don't want to associate you fighting with me with being angry. There's places they're not allowed to hit me, believe it or not. <laughs> there are things that are off limits. There's ground rules when we're fighting. We need to be respectful of one another. I'm not angry with my kids when I'm fighting them, when we're wrestling. I love them, and it's with joy that we wrestle. So there's ground rules. Luke 18 Uh, Jesus told a parable, and I want to I want to show you this respect that is that is necessary when we're wrestling against God. Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they must always pray and not give up. He said, "In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought, and there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary.' And for some time, he refused." But finally he said to himself, even though I don't hear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. All right, so the respect. She was addressing the judge in a respectful way. She was making a valid application through the processes of the law. This is what we're supposed to do. And even though the judge is unjust, we still respect those in authority over us. It's when sometimes people feel like they don't have a voice or sometimes people feel like they aren't getting justice. That's when tempers boil over and bad things happen. That's why our leaders seem to have a finger on the the pulse of the people sometimes and they say, maybe I had better give them justice because something is about to happen. And he says, she might eventually come and attack me if I don't give her justice. So even though she's addressing him respectfully because she is so persistent and she comes again and again and again. Eventually, the judge says, uh, I better give her justice. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. So God says, even the unjust judge will give you what you ask if you are persistent, if you're respectful. And God himself is not an unjust judge. He's not a person who, who has no regard for you. He doesn't really give a rip whether you're suffering or thriving. He says God is someone who is for you and wants to give you justice. And he wants you to continue to come to him, continue to pursue him. And he will give you justice. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Or will he find a bunch of people that just gave up? and said, oh, God's not for us. Let's just pitch that and we'll put our heads down and, and take what's coming to us. We'll just take our medicine. Or will he find faith on the earth? This is what he's talking about, faith on the earth. It's people who continue to crash the gates of heaven, to violently take it by force, because it is our birthright. Justice is our birthright. And we need to continue to go to war. Jesus also was our example. Oh, here, in Luke, uh, in the garden, of Gethsemane, Jesus went through a spiritual war. He was wrestling with his father. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, 
Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. So we see that he is surrendering his will to God. And that might look like he's not really wrestling with God. He's just saying, God, whatever you want to do. But he definitely did ask. And he said, please take this cup from me. And as we read further, it says, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And it was because the angel strengthened him, he didn't say, okay, now I'm strong, now I can take whatever God's going to give me. Because the angel strengthened him, he was in anguish and he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. This is what Jesus did with his strength as he continued to engage and wrestle with God because he knew he needed to be unified with his father. He, need, he knew that his father was still teaching him to war. He was still teaching him to be strong. And as God gave him more strength, he used that strength to fight. He didn't use that strength just to say, oh, thank you. Thank you for strengthening me. Now I can endure. But he used that strength to war with God and to continue to pray and continue to crash, crash the gates of heaven. The world is watching what happens when we're afflicted. You ever feel like that? You feel like, how did these eight things all happen to happen in the same hour? And, you, and sometimes you feel like, this is not normal. This isn't just chance. This is, there's something happened to me. There's something going on here. And it's so tempting to just shake your fist at the world and say, I don't deserve this. This is too much for me. And I, I need to, you need to leave me alone. And, and I've finally begun to realize that all those things are happening with a purpose. And it quite likely is the enemy piling on you. He knows he's about to get you down, so let's throw one more thing at him. And if that doesn't get him down, let's throw one more thing. Let's throw one more thing. And I'm realizing that it's not about all those things that are going wrong. Okay, the cow dies on the same day in the same hour that I can't start the tractor because it's so cold and all the pipes in the barn are froze and I can't clean up and everything is just... Then you come in and the kid doesn't understand this, that I have had a bad day and they need this and this and this. And, and it can be easy to feel like, what is going on here? I'm telling you, there is something going on. There's something that's going on is the enemy is piling everything on you at the same time to try to break you but it's not for all these things to go wrong. They don't care about that, and you shouldn't care about that much. What's really happening is they're trying to make you sin. They're trying to make you lose your testimony. And I'm realizing that now, and I've, I've begun to laugh at it and say, I'm not going to lose my testimony over this. When you're so tempted to get angry, when you're so tempted to you know, throw something as hard as you can, and you realize that's actually going to make the situation worse. And what I need to do is... Praise God. And what I need to do is recognize the situation I'm in and realize that the enemy is watching how we react to these situations. And I'm not going to give him the satisfaction. The satisfaction of making me fall. Everything that we're going through is a test. Everything is a struggle. Everything is a wrestling match. <clears throat> Sometimes you've Satan knows exactly how to get you in a position where you're going to lose. This is, a, this is a situation that if you're black, you should recognize that you're in a lot of trouble right here. When you're looking at the board, you don't, they don't always put arrows there for you. You have to be able to look at that and say, oh, I guess next move, white is going to come move his queen and take that pawn. And I better do something about that. And if you don't recognize that, you're going to find yourself in trouble. You're going to find yourself checkmated. How often does that have to happen for you to be checkmated, for you to recognize that this is what's going on? We need to, be, we need to learn from our mistakes. I was, in a, I was playing chess with a guy one time, and I don't know, about six moves in, six, seven moves in, I had him like this, and he didn't see it, checkmate. So obviously he says, I want to rematch. rematch. All right, so we'll play again. And the next time, I don't know, it was eight or nine moves in, and I had, it was like that again. I was like, he's got to see it. I just did this to him. But he didn't. So I moved the queen there again. I want to rematch. So the next time I was like, he's not seeing this. I, I hope he's seeing it. So the next time I had exactly this position on the board. I went straight to it. Four moves in, checkmate. He was looking at that. And then he wanted to rematch. And I did it to him a fourth time. 
and I'm not that great of a chess player. It was just, I think it was to make this illustration to you guys. I think that's why this happened. <laughs> because how often do we get in a position we feel like, I've been here before. How did this just happen? When someone checkmates you, you always say, let's back up a couple moves, and I want to see what that looked like before I was in trouble. So when you guys fall into sin, take a minute and step back a few steps and say, what situation did I get myself in to get into this position? How is it possible that this happened to me again? The fourth time in a half an hour, I did the same thing again. Something got to be that I should be able to recognize. We get this in our, in our marriage. I mean, how often do we have discussions with our spouse? We say, all right, when I say this, and then she says that, and then I say this, and she says that, and I say this, and she says that, and we end up in a fight, and nobody wins. And can we back up several steps and say, that started when I said this, and I knew that she was going to say that, but something in my head thought that that was still the right thing to say. And then I, said, I thought that was the right thing to say. And she thought that was the right, even though we've done this a hundred times. And it's never ended well. We need to recognize when we're in the path to be checkmated. When we're in the path for Satan to say, just sit back there and laughing at us. He's like, I've had him here before, and he's going to be here again. All I've got to do is set his foot down that road, and he's going to see that sign, and he's going to pull over to that corner and talk to that guy. And I got him. He knows all these moves because he's played us so many times. And we need to recognize these things. So we're going to talk about some moves. All right, we're going to talk about some wrestling moves. And I need a volunteer. Ethan, thank you for volunteering. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> when you're in wrestling, there's a move called a half Nelson, right? And actually, even better is the full Nelson. But you're not allowed to do this because it's dangerous. I could break his neck right now. You couldn't do much about it. So we don't do this in wrestling. We might do like the chicken wing. And you feel a little vulnerable right now? Yeah. <laughs> like, I got this. I got this. <clears throat> I love the chicken wing. It's, it's, it's not nearly as embarrassing as the cowtail, which I won't show you right now. <laughs> but there's an easy way to get out of this for Ethan. And you might know it. All right, you, you, just, you take your right hand, and okay. you bring it up, and you grab my fingers. Mm -hmm. Just pull them off. There's not much I can do about that. And if, if he's good enough at it, or if I don't let him do it, then he just keeps my fingers. Those fingers are his now. So that's how you, that's how you get out of a half Nelson. So next time you're in a position, thank you, Ethan, again. <laughs> so next time you're in a position, you feel vulnerable. Allow God to train you. Allow God to put you in that vulnerable position and say, okay, God, what do I do now? He says, bring your hands up here, grab my fingers, and pull them back. If the enemy ever gets you in that position, don't be afraid. Don't be, uh, don't be ashamed to just wrench his fingers and break him. You know, when you're wrestling, you're allowed to break a guy's fingers. You're allowed to do that. And it's, I mean, he shouldn't have been in that spot. He shouldn't have let you do it. So that's his problem. And when you're wrestling the enemy, you can do anything you want to him. You're allowed low blows, punch in the face, whatever you want to do. You're allowed to do that because he's earned it. Because he has every right to you if you leave God's protection, if you leave God's covering. He has every right to do to you what he wants. However, when you are in his protection, he's still going to be coming after you. Even when you are in the city of refuge, he's still going to be seeking whom he may devour. And he has no right to you there. So he is off limits. He's breaking the rules. And you can do whatever you want to him. So <clears throat> my friend Devar, back to Devar again, he, uh, he persisted in wrestling. He actually got pretty good at it. And he talked about how you need one escape move, one takedown move, and one pin move. And, of course, if you're good at wrestling, you got all kinds of takedown moves and pin moves. But if you're someone at our level then if you just practice one move over and over and over and over again until you got it, you're going to be pretty good at it. So this is what he would always do. He'd have one escape, one takedown, and one pin move. So we're going to go over those. I'm going to teach you an escape move, a takedown move, and a pin move in the spirit. The escape move. 
1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except something common to mankind. And God is faithful, so he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you, what you are able, but with temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Now, sometimes he gives us things that we can't handle. He gives us more than we are able to handle. But he will never give you more temptation than you can handle. There's always an escape from the temptation. So what is that escape? Well, there's a famous story in Acts 16, 25 and 26. It says, now about midnight, Paul and Silas, after they've been beaten and put in prison, bad day, right? How can this also be happening to me? They were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. You see what the escape move was there? It was praise. You feel like you're in a bad spot. You feel vulnerable. You feel like you're about to lose. You start praising God. And he says, this is what is going to shake the foundations of the enemy's dungeon. It doesn't matter where you are. I will give you an escape from temptation when you praise me. And this has happened plenty of times in my life. I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, Lord, I took a few steps down the wrong road. I know where I'm headed. And he says, praise me. Praise me. And when you're praising God, it is very difficult to sin. Your escape from temptation is praise. That's, and there are others too. There are other, other wonderful things you can do in the spirit, tools he's given you. But I want you to practice that one move until you've got it down, until you are unstoppable. It doesn't matter what situation you are in, you automatically default to praising God so often that you know exactly how to do it, and it becomes automatic, and you will escape from every situation. And he's going to give you other tools too. That's the one that you can praise. Your takedown move. Joshua 6, 16 through 20. The seventh time when, when the priest blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for God has given you the city. Do you remember what was happening here? They're walking around Jericho, the greatest city of its day, and the walls are still standing there. One, day, one time a day for seven days, they just walked around and they said nothing. Can you imagine how intimidating that would be for the people in the city? Here's this huge crowd of maybe 600,000 men walking around the city saying nothing, silent as the grave. And then the seventh day, they walk around seven times, and Joshua tells them, shout. Is the shout to bring the walls down? The shout is for joy because God has given them the city. So the people shouted, and the priests blew the trumpets, and when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. So the people went up and into the city, and everyone straight ahead, and they took the city because they shouted for joy. Even though they could see the walls still standing there, and they saw the problem still in front of them, unsolved, God said, I have taken care of this for you. And you need to act as if you're my children. You need to act as if this problem is already solved. He said, shout, for God has given you the city. And they could have looked in the walls and said, no, he hasn't. It's still standing there. You could look at your doctor's report and say, no, I haven't. I still have cancer. And you do. It's still there. But God says, shout for joy because I have taken care of this for you. And we need to be praising God and shouting for joy. My takedown move is joy. When I'm wrestling with my father, I have joy. When I'm wrestling with God, when I perceive this isn't the enemy, fighting against me. This is, this is God. He wants me to push. He wants me to struggle. There's joy. When I would spar with my friend Devar, when we would just wrestle together, and he had these amazing moves that I could not, he could get me every time, it was still fun. And when I play chess with him, and I know he's better than I am, and he's going to beat me, it's still fun. To engage in the battle is fun. In my kids, when we're wrestling together, they should have joy in their hearts, even though they've got maybe a grimace on their face because they're so passionate and they're fighting so hard, and Peter's ramming into me with his head as hard as he can. He's happy. He loves it. He is up. Joy is our takedown move. That's how we take the enemy out. We need to be passionate and forceful. Armies traditionally would enter battle with a song. This was a normal thing. When they're riding the horses, they'd be singing. The battle hymn of the Republic is a song. He sounded forth a trumpet that shall never sound retreat. He's sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. 
Our God is marching on. There needs to be joy when we're engaging in the battle. And when we're engaging with him, that's how we take him down. Because we're happy. Because we know that this battle has already been won. We need to be shouting for God has given us the city. So, the escape move is praise. The takedown move is joy. And we got a pin move. All right, now Devar's pin move against me was something we called the Griff Horse Press. We used to hang out with these guys who wrestled for Granville, and they were, uh, they, they often went to state, these brothers. And of course, they're better than us. But they invented this, this new move, and we all called it the Griff Horse Press. And they would, um, it's, it's you, you, when you're down on the ground, all right, the takedown has happened, and you're wrestling on the ground, and you take your legs and you wrap it around their opposite leg, and you take your arms and you wrap it around their opposite arm, so they got their body in here, and then you just squeeze as hard as you can and straighten your body, so the whole of your back is engaged in just stretching them. You're putting that whole side of their body on the rack, and it is so much fun to do that, because <laughs> wrestling is all about putting on the hurt, right? If, if they won't get out of the turtle, you just cross-face them until they lay down, because anything you're allowed to do to put on the hurt, it intimidates them. So the grip force press, you can't really pin someone with that. You just hurt them so bad that eventually they lay down. They say, uncle, I quit. I, I can't handle this anymore. And that's what he, was always, he would always do to me. And I knew it was coming. I knew he was going to put me in that move because it was his pin move. But I could never stop it because that's what he did every single time. So I'm going to teach you guys a pin move that you can do every single time and it will be unstoppable. So your pin move is in Romans 12, 17 through 21. Never take your own revenge, beloved. But leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. If we try to take vengeance on people, then they are going to miss out on the wrath of God, which is much more just and appropriate and exactly what that person needs. When we try to take our place and, and take vengeance on a person, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Our pin move is love. That's counterintuitive. We feel like we're in a battle, but we know that we are not battling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And when we see someone fighting against us, when we see that person, we need to know that they are lost, that that person is deceived, that person is suffering. And we see this over and over when people, we hear stories coming out of concentration camps, not of prisons, where people are being severely persecuted for their faith. They say, I had so much love for my persecutors. I got to know them. I got to know their, who their families were, what their heart, what was on their, what their hopes were, and their family troubles, and their marriage, and I just prayed for them and loved them. And you say, how can you possibly love in a situation like that? You have to understand that that's exactly what they're trying to take from you. They're trying to take your love. The spirit of this age is hate. They're, trying to, they're, they're filled with hate, and they're trying to make us hate. And we need to be known by our love. The Bible says that we, they will know that we're Christians by our love. And this is the thing that disarms the enemy. The more we suffer, the more we can love. And that's how they're going to know that we're different from the world. We're not like them. And as we love them, they'll be overcome. We're going to have an unbreakable spirit. And maybe it feels like right now that we couldn't do that. If I was in that situation, how could I possibly love that person that's hurting me, hurting my family maybe? But that's what they say. That's what they say when they come out of those situations. say, somehow God gave me this overwhelming love for these people who are trying to overwhelm me with hate. It's realizing that hate is exactly the position they want to get you in. They want you to join them in their hate. And instead, we say, I am on God's side, and God is love. And I'm going to demonstrate to you the love of God. And that is unstoppable. When we love them, they'll, they'll, they'll say, uncle. They'll put their shoulders to the ground, and they say, you got me. I, I can't do anything to you anymore. And that's often when the persecution stops. And you see, this person, it doesn't matter what I do to them, they still love me. The more I persecute them, the more they love me. 
And either they will turn to your side and they'll stop hurting you, or they will say, I can't turn this person. The more I hurt them, the more they love. So I'm going to stop hurting them because I don't want them to love anymore. There may come a day when the van pulls up to your, to your driveway and they say, get in the van. And you've got to make a decision. Are you going to go into the dungeon or go into whatever place that they may have prepared for you? Are you going to trust yourself into the arms of the government? But when you're there, if, you happen to, if that happens to you, you have to realize that they have just invited a son or a daughter of God within their midst. They have invited the most powerful thing right into the stronghold of the enemy. They have done something very dangerous. They have exposed themselves to the love of God. And that's the power that we have as children of God. That is our birthright. We are invited into the family of Israel. When God says, I want you to be my son, that means we are grafted into Israel and we receive the birthright of that passion of the man who struggled with God and with man and overcame. We have the same birthright as children of Israel to be able to go into the world and be so passionate and so strong and love so recklessly and forcefully that the enemy lays down and he gives up so that even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil for his rod and his staff that comfort us. He prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And we don't need to be afraid. If we learn to have effort in a safe place, then we can have effort where it's dangerous. That's the only way we're ever going to be able to have effort where it's dangerous. What if God is giving us the opportunity when we're struggling against him, when life seems like it's not going very well, seems like everything is going wrong, and we say, God, thy will be done, which is not a bad thing to say, but there are times when God says, that's not good enough. I don't want you to just throw up your hands and back away. I'm not going to help you this time because I have given you the ability to go out there and have praise on your heart. I have given you the ability to have joy so that you can take the enemy down. I have given you the ability to love in unlovable situations so that you can take care of this problem. And if we, we step back from that challenge and say, no, God, I'm not even going to struggle with you. I'm not going to wrestle with you. Like my precious little Susie, she hates to see the other kids beat up on me. So she gets in between there and she just loves on me and she loves me so much. And that's wonderful. I love to have that with her. But at some point I say, Susie, I want you to fight. I want you to learn how to try hard. And if we're not going to learn this in a safe place with God, realizing that we're not really in danger, we're still in God's hands and we're fine, then what's going to happen when it is dangerous? Are you going to strive in the real battle if you don't strive when you're struggling against God? This is what God is trying to teach us to do. He's trying to teach our hands to war, and we need to engage with him. He won't throw us into the struggle untried. He will train us, and we will hold on to him and not let him go until he blesses us. Not let him go until he says, good job. That's exactly what I wanted you to do. Now you have strived to the maximum, and I'm going to give you what you're asking for, or I'm going to give you something good. This is a wonderful birthright we have of being passionate, of being strong. And you might think of yourself and say, I'm, I'm not really that way. I'm not naturally like that. I'm, I'm a Susie. I just want to snuggle God. I'm a Mary. I just want to sit in his presence and look in his eyes. And God says, that's fine. Those are good things to do. But there's a battle out there. And when I'm giving you a hard time, when I'm bothering you, when I'm poking you and seeing what's going to happen, what are you going to do? Are you going to just say, God, do whatever you want? Or are you going to say, okay with a smile on your face, with a joy in your heart, say, let's do this. Let's game on, God. Let's engage. I want to feel your strength. I want to feel how strong you are. I want to show you what I can do so that you can have confidence in me and I can have confidence in you that when the time comes, we will be safe and we will be able to have victory against the enemy. <clears throat> let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you have shown us exactly what it, needs, what it takes to belong to you, and to be part of your family. You have made us in your image, and you are not a panty waste. You are a strong, strong father, a warrior. 
one who has done something so amazing as to sacrifice yourself for us who were the enemy. While we were still enemies, you loved us. And we ask, God, that you would show us what it looks like and show us what it takes to belong to you, to be part of your family, to, to grab hold of your birthright and to struggle with you so that when the enemy comes, we will have automatically on our heart that we know how to praise and escape any grip of the enemy, that we will know how to have joy and be able to take him down even though the walls are still standing there. And we will be able to have love so that we can slay them with our passion and our joy and our love and they will have no answer for being in the presence of a son or daughter of yours who has true love in their heart. Thank you for that birthright, Lord, where we can walk in this world with confidence and not be afraid and not be ashamed. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. As always, if there's anybody who wants to come and we'd love to pray with you, if there's something you feel like I've given up struggling on this issue and I just, I need to, I need to engage with God again. I need to re-engage. I need to, I need to know what it's like to be passionate and prayerful. We'd love to pray with you. The elders will come up. We'll spend some time praying with you and encourage you. Yes, you should engage God. I hope you've enjoyed this. To hear other messages, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF Messages. You may also follow Georgetown Christian Fellowship with our app. Go to either iOS or the Play Store for Android and search for Word Server. That's one word, Word Server. And install the free application. There you will get all of our messages, including streaming capability. 